thank you all for sticking around. Um, it was just such a stunning performance, and I'm sure you all feel the same way. And uh, before we even start, I'd like to thank her again, Margaret Langton. You know, I, I just have a few questions. I mean, I have a lot of questions, and I'll, I'll have to give you a call at some time, and we'll have to talk them over. But the, just a few questions for now to kind of help us um, kind of understand what we just experienced, and maybe just going in order of the program. This wonderful opener, uh, it's, it's something that uh, I think that people, f I, this, I'll just describe my experience. You don't really know when it's the tape, or when it's the playback, or when it's you, but what we see is this beautiful choreography mm. that you're doing and the way that you, uh, you know, manage to you know, pluck at times, but you're not totally sure if that's, the, that's what's happening on stage or if it's happening elsewhere in your, in your head. And uh, I guess I wonder, uh, the pr you have a long experience with this, pr with this piece. It goes back, I think, 30 years or so. 19, early 1990s. Yeah. Early 1990s is when Chris r first wrote it for me, Christopher Hopkins, and it was a much longer piece because there were two movements that he has since um, excised, just re uh, reducing it only to the bowing movements. There was a whole lot of other very interesting stuff, plucking inside and strumming the strings and so on, which made the piece 19 minutes long. And I used to play that version quite a lot but now he's made this condensed version, which I think works very well um, on a program because it's, it's much more manageable, I think. Absolutely, and I, but I think one of the questions that comes to mind is, uh, how did you put this together? How did it come together in terms of uh, your work with the playback component um, versus the way that you just practice without it, or how did, how did you put it together? Well, it's basically a case of drill, baby, drill. It really is. Drill, baby, drill. And did I drill? <laughs> you know, after a hiatus of 20 years, the last time I played it was in Melbourne in 2002. That's how long ago it was. Um, I thought it wouldn't be too hard to get it back into my body, the, the rhythms, especially that, that very raging, stormy part. The rhythms there are very, very complicated. And I had drilled it before, 20 years ago. And usually these things stick stick in my um, unconscious. They just have to be pulled from the back of the filing cabinet to the front. But this time I found it, I really had to rework and relearn and redrill and drill and drill again before I could get it back. And I, I, I really found it quite a challenge. But what was really interesting was all my bowing techniques of how to, to bow and how the flick of the wrist when you turn so that it's, it's a seamless join, all that stuff came right back. That was just like embedded in your um, musculature. It's like riding a bicycle. If you, once you've learned to ride a bicycle, you can ride it no matter how long you haven't ridden a bicycle. So it's that same kind of thing the body remembers. Um, and I spent a whole year working on it before I performed it in public because I'm, I'm not a string player. I'm a pianist. <laughs> I, I used to be anyway. <laughs> so this was a whole new technique of learning to bow. And I had done some of it already in John Cage's music because in John Cage's late works, the number pieces, he liked to incorporate bowing, but very simple bowing. And in fact, it's very interesting. Um, I worked with John Cage the day before he had his massive stroke. I went to see him to um, discuss this piece that he had written for me, one in the, in the number series, um, to discuss how I would realize it in, in a, it, because it was an indeterminate piece. And I did show him the score of Christopher Hopkins' Arched Interiors, the original 19-minute score, because I was working on it at that time. He was very, very intrigued by it and fascinated by it. And he asked me when I was going to perform it and so on and so forth. But then he died the next day. The next day, he had this huge, um, you know, fatal stroke. So, uh, in fact, you can read about it. If you go to the um, New York Times on the first anniversary of his death in 1993, which would be, the, he died in 1992, and I went to see him in August, and he died on August 12th, and I went to see him the day before. And um, I wrote about it, and the New York Times published this memoir a year later, um, 
in, in tribute to John Cage um, on the first anniversary of his death. I think that if you look under the music, John Cage poses a few last questions is the name of the article. If you Google it with just John Cage's name and my name, it'll come up. And I read it occasionally um, 30 years later. It is 30 years this year, you know, that he died, 1992. Um, and I, I, I still feel it very vividly. Well, it's, I mean, it's such a, um, I mean, it's a powerful story and of course, uh, I, I would have been very curious to hear what he thought of it, of getting to hear the yeah, piece. That was just about the last score he looked at that was not his, you know, um, that day. Right, right. Well, listen, you mentioned being a pianist. <laughs> and uh, one of the... I, I used to be a right, pianist. Exactly. Well, this is one of the things I wanted to bring up because in the next piece, The Cowl, um, you basically, I was speaking with a mutual composer friend earlier and it's, it came up, this is not, I'm paraphrasing, but... This is kind of a compendium of techniques that composers steal, but we didn't know it was from that piece. Ah. <laughs> so there's this element of you having to uh, kind of learn a new instrument uh, with each movement or with each... Except I've done it all before. Except, okay. <laughs> <laughs> In earlier Cowell works, you know, he, he has already e explored some of these techniques. So uh, it's not anything new for me, these techniques, because I've already encountered them before. But what was the interesting challenge is the way he makes you co-creator. In a different way that Cage would make you co-creator in his indeterminate pieces, but Cowell makes you co-creator in the sense that the score is in manuscript. It's not easily playable depending on what size grand you have. Um, and he tells you, go ahead, make all the um, modifications you need to make it work. And I, I did enjoy that process of having my own personal input in it, into it with the composer's blessing. <laughs> yeah. You see, like things I did, um, I used a, mute, a, a felt coated muting stick because I get a much better sound with that and control than just the palm of my hand. It doesn't sound anything as good as, as that. So I'm sure Carl wouldn't mind. I mean, I'm, I'm getting the effect he wanted, so that's the important thing. How much of a problem is it to encounter different pianos but when you have yeah, such a different he architecture? Yeah, he said play it on a grand, but, not, but he said it would probably work better on a smaller grand. Well, that's a seven-foot B, which works beautifully for me. I don't think I can do it on a nine-foot grand because I can't reach far enough in to get to the harmonics, <laughs> you know? Um, yeah, I mean, the... Um, and that's why I wedge the pedal, so that uh, I have a little bit more um, extension, because my foot's not glued to the pedal, you see? Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, just for the uh, people who have never tried to work around inside the piano, uh, maybe, maybe the pianists who just have uh, experience just on the keys, there, how long did it take you to become, I mean, this has been your bread and butter for so long, but how long did it take you to become proficient in kind of understanding that new architecture, or the architecture inside the piano versus, you know, on the keys, and then, of course, when we get to the crumb, the combination of them? And ah, this is where you can run into a huge problem. Hmm. You see, the interior beams of the grants, even the Steinway, different models of Steinways, have the beams that intersect at different points on the strings. And this is a nightmare, really, because um, how many of us are privileged to have a concert grand in our home, okay? And that's what you land up performing on 90% of the time. So I know by now a concert grand interior where the beams intersect like the back of my hand, but it, but whenever I, I, I learn a new piece, say this crumb work, I have to have access to a concert grand to practice on it before I perform because I only have a seven foot B at home. That's the size of, of the Cowell piano that I, I, I played on. And the beams don't intersect in the same place. So, you know, when I first realized this, it was a nightmare because I didn't know that different Steinways had different interior mapping layouts. And it's like that bad dream that Nureyev would have that he would be caught 
you know, in his street shoes on stage. So it's like, <laughs> you're so used to, to the choreography of doing this plucking, 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 plucking on this side of the beam, and all of a sudden the note that you want on a concert grant happens to be on the other side of the beam. So you have to rework all your choreography, which you have drilled and drilled into your, your um, muscle memory. It's a nightmare when I first discovered this problem. So now I'm very, very um, aware of it and I deal with it. And I even gave George, now this is really important, I gave George a, a very enlarged drawing, a diagram of a Steinway concert grand interior so he could see where all the beams intersect so that he wouldn't do anything like strum across a beam, <laughs> which he has done. <laughs> And so um, I, I'm always reminding him, George, did you, check the, did you check the diagram? Like the very first piece, this is interesting, that one called Abstract in Black, um, Medieval Sounds, okay? He had all the bass drums cutting right across the beam. So I, I pointed that out to him. I said, George, you've been a very bad boy. You didn't look at the chart. <laughs> and then poor George, had to, he realized that you could do it all an octave lower and, and make the strum lower. He had to change it. He'd already given me that, no, he'd already written that score in, in, in ink and everything already. It took him hours to rewrite it for that. But then he did put a little postscript saying on a smaller piano where you can strum up there, I, I would prefer it if you strummed on the upper register. <laughs> You didn't want it to go to waste. <laughs> Composers always get their way somehow. And the, uh, that's great. What, um, one last question about the cowls. How did you come to find the cowl? Now, this is really, really an interesting um, story. This work has lain 70 years in the archives of the Library of Congress, collecting dust. Right? Well, we try to clean them and keep it messy. <laughs> Oh, you dust. <laughs> All right, you dust. Okay, so, so it doesn't collect dust. <laughs> I have a very good friend called David Lewis, who's quite the expert on Cowell, and I think he's here tonight. David, are you here? I'm right here. Ah, good. All right. So about 13 years ago, David had told me about this piece. So I ferreted it out. And I realized that, you know, it, it took me 13 years to finally get around to performing it, that this was really a hidden treasure. Nobody knows about it. And not even the Cowell Foundation knows about it. So when I finally was going to perform it here, I had to get permission from the Cowell Trust to perform it. And they didn't even know about the piece, so I told them about it. And, and they gave me the permission, and then they finally registered the piece now with BMI. It's now officially recorded, okay, in the, in the, uh, um, in the BMI um, list of composers' works added to the Cowell repertoire. Then we weren't sure. Now, he had made it for a dance, okay. So my assumption was that he must have performed it live with the dancer, and then that was the end of it. In 1954 is when he wrote it. But then I had thought maybe we should put it down as a revival on the program. After 70 years, I think that would be a fair enough word to use. But then I asked David, and David said he'd heard a recording by Cowell playing it, and he said it was probably a recording made by Cowell for the dancer to practice and to perform with. Because David says there's no sound of footfalls or feet or any extraneous noises. It was a studio recording that he had done for her to work with. So in that case, David and I finally decided, okay, I think it's safe. We can call it a... Live performance premiere? Live performance premiere. <laughs> Well, uh, to, to finish up, I mean, we have this massive work by George Crumb, and you're 
you were very, very close to him, and he wrote the first book of the Metamorphoses uh, with you in he mind. He wrote book one for me, and yeah. this is book two, which is written for Mark Antonio Baroni. Yeah. Maybe you can just tell us a bit about, I mean, there's so much to talk about with this piece. It's such, it's crumb, in a, it's still very much him, and it's very... Um, it's I, very elegaic. Sure, yeah. yeah but it's, ah, uh, that spirit of the dead watching, I mean, that is like foreboding. It's like a premonition of death. Is that the, the one that has the, the B-A-C-H? Yeah, yeah. B-A-C-H motif. But that really, it's dark. It's, it's, but a lot of the piece, and a lot of book one is dark. Mm. He uses the crows over the wheat field by Van Gogh, which is mm. you know, a very for, um, ominous piece. You know, I find, I find his um, bird references are more of the Schumann variety than the Messian variety in, in terms of the prophet, prophecy kind of component. Of yes, that bird movement here mm -hmm. reminds me of um, the Schumann, the prophet. Vogelau's prophet, prophet. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, no, but but the, you're, when you came to play this piece, what are some of the, the interactions that you had with George Crumb um, when it came to playing book two? I didn't have any interaction with George on book two because he died. Oh. But book one mm -hmm. was a, a, a very wonderful experience for me because, you know, since his macrocosmos from the 1970s, that major piano cycle, George hadn't really, he'd written many works, for, several works for piano, but not a, another extended cycle. And, you know, one day I, I said to him, to me, George, the two greatest works of the avant-garde piano literature of the 20th century are John Cage's Sonatas and Interludes and your Macrocosmos Cycles. And George said, hmm, maybe I should write another cycle. <laughs> and then he thought about it, and a year later, I went to visit him on July 4th, and then he just dropped his bombshell. He dropped his jaw-dropping bombshell. He said, Margaret, I'm ready to write another cycle, major piano cycle, and I'm going to write book one for you. And then he started pulling out all these art books with these paintings that he had chosen to use um, to depict in sound, and he calls it his tribute to Mussorgsky's pictures at an exhibition. Um, and that was the beginning of this really interesting process where he would write a movement, and then I would go and get it, and I'd go back home and learn it, and after about a month or six weeks, we had an unspoken agreement that I would bring it back, play it for him, and then he'd give me the next movement. So there was this rhythm that got established. And he was so modest, you know. George was really a genuinely modest man. You know what he would say when he'd give it to me, a, a movement, he says, Margaret, he says, if this is garbage, just tell me so, and I'll, I'll write it all over again. Can you imagine? I mean, he, he was that mod, and he wasn't being just fake humble. He really said, he meant it when he said that. And then the excitement, I loved the excitement when he heard his music for the first time. I played for him in his really out of tune Steinway, because he never tuned it. Uh, made it sound very exotic, actually. And then, he, I would play it for him, and I still remember playing the first piece in book one, The Black Prince by Paul Clay. And George was so excited about hearing his music, and he, he, he opened the door and called out to his wife, who was in the kitchen, he says, Liz, come and hear this, I've written a good piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, so this, was, this was for me a great experience over a span of two years, 19, no, 2015 till 2017, when I premiered it at the National Gallery in 2017. It, it took two years to write it. And um, what was really also very interesting, it's all happened to do with timing. I met a young man, who, um, or a, a young man filmmaker sought me out because he had surfed the web looking for a subject for his master's thesis, and he decided that I was going to be it. <laughs> yeah, for his master's thesis at the School of Visual Arts in New York. He's a young man from China. He was all of 25 at that time. 
So I said, um, he came to see me and I said, I don't need another film, I've already got a film about me where George calls me Sorceress of the New Piano. <laughs> That old witch. So, um, so he said, ah, but he said that was 13 years ago. It's, it's, you, you need a new film. So I said, all right, do you want to be in on something historic? Then you come down with me to media every time I go to visit George Crumb. And you document us working. Because I realized that these sessions were very, very valuable for future generations. You know, to see this exchange between us and how George react and tell me things and I would discuss it with him and it was really very lively. So Chuang came and he was wonderful, he was like a fly on the wall and he filmed like 16 hours of footage and before he went back to China he put it all on a hard drive and it's now right here in the Library of Congress. Oh and he made a film from it, he made a beautiful film on the making of Metro Metamorphosis Book One, um, and as well as my work with the toy piano, and and the film is called Twinkle, damn it, and it <laughs> went on to win a lot of prizes. It was amazing. It went, to, you know, this is his first documentary feature film, and it went to win several prizes at international film festivals. It was amazing. And George, you see, in this piece, he wrote it in a way that. Um, use instruments and toys that I like to use in my work. So he included the toy piano um, in Chagall's Clowns at Night and the mixture of the toy piano and the grand piano is spooky, it's really spooky. It's very, very, very magical and sinister at the same time. So he did um, use all kinds of toy percussion and stuff and, and so that piece is like, Taylor made to, to my, you know, likes. And he was a bit worried that other pianists would have trouble um, learning it, but I don't think so, because now uh, several other pianists have started working on the piece. And there's one movement, the, the Crows at Night, that I said, where George wanted me to crow, because I like doing interesting things with my voice. So I, I, I learned to crow. I learned to call from the crows in George's garden. <laughs> and I would go like this. Ka, 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 in the piece, you know. Uh, I would, this would be very, very mournful. <laughs> and, 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 and George loved it. <laughs> well, we're, we're running out of time, but I just, um, I love hearing all these stories. And I wonder if you just have uh, any last thing you'd like to say about George Crumb and the piece and just, or just your, feelings about things in general. I'm just so uh, pleased that you came and we were finally able to do this concert and have you play these three wonderful pieces. Yes, you know, I was quite bereft when George died in February. I mean, I knew the end was coming. Um, you know, 10 days after he gave me the score, which was on July 4th, he had a stroke 10 days later. And he never, he never really recovered from that. So that was in July, and, and then he died in February at age 92. I still miss him terribly, but the fact that I had this wonderful piece to learn and to delve deep into in the months after his death. It was like he was there. He was there keeping me company and listening over my shoulder. So I feel very, very privileged to have had that score given to me at that time. And um, to finally perform it now here, where his archives are, is a great honor. Thank you, David, for inviting me. Thank you. Um, let's just have one more round of applause for Margaret Lang Tan, and thank you for coming.